they got like that sensing technique. You can just like put it wherever you want on the cooktop and it'll just like you free range all your pots and pans and it'll mm. just like, oh, you got a pot here? I'll cook here. And it won't burn you. Yeah, right? and you can touch it. It's yeah. not hot. How does that work? Because it like excites the electrons in the pot or something. Yeah. With what? A little song? Welcome to the Find Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Associate Editor Matt Milham. Hello. And Special Guest, Editorial Director Justin Fink. Hey, guys. Please email, email us your questions at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at findhomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, gentlemen, thanks for joining me again today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last time you were here, Justin, you were talking to us about the possibility of making storm windows. Mm. I did. I made them. All of them? Well, I have built them. They are, uh, I'll give you the the status and then I'll talk some details, but um, they're all built. Uh, They're waiting for primer. And as of this morning, I ordered the glass. Cool. Yes. So, um, are they all the same size? No, I don't think. I think like three. <laughs> That'd be of them, too easy. I think like three of them are the same size. And yeah. how much do they vary? Is it like a quarter or an eighth of an inch, or is it actually like? I've got a lot of different size windows. Okay. In my house, just in general, because um, I have like big windows flanked by narrow ones, like mm-hmm. a big, like it's a, sort of a craftsman style, um, and then a lot of just kind of standard double hungs, but the height varies depending if it's a bathroom or a bedroom, second floor, first floor. Do you have um, any of them that are the same size? There's a few. Uh-huh. Seriously, like a few. <laughs> uh, I think I think it ended up at 20 windows. Um, so, you know, roughly 40 pieces of glass. Some of them have a single piece, the smallest ones. Um, so that order went out today for, I don't know, 600 bucks for the glass. Wow, that seems like a lot. Yeah. Um, and that's cut, and it's a local place, and that was actually less than another quote I got. Do they glaze them, or do they just no. give you the glass? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> I was going to say, if that was, they were glazing, that'd be a deal. They give That's, you the opportunity to drop it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually leaning away. So so the way I put it together, I had high hopes of doing this complicated finger joint. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I even had the, the domino out, and I was like, well, I'm going to do this. This will save me some time. You mean time. the joinery for the frames? Right. Okay. So I use, so I get the domino out, and uh, and I just gotten – a while back, I just gotten uh, – a CMT. You guys know CMT. They make uh, other blades and bits and things to that orange company. Yep. Mm-hmm. So they make domino uh, tenon bits for the domino system. Really? Yeah. Like a third party bit. So I buy one, put it in there. It broke on the first joint. It <laughs> snapped in half <laughs> in, in white pine. Jeez. Um, so that's clearly good. a manufacturing CMT. problem. Yeah. I guess. Uh, and, um, and I've had other ones that were not a problem. They're significantly cheaper. In, I should say significantly less expensive. I don't know if they're cheaper or whatever. Um, but anyway, so that that was my only bit in that size. And I was like, well, now I got to go to like the local Woodcraft to find one because there's no other stores that carry Rings those. Rings in, but my, uh, a local one. That would be even yeah. farther from yeah. me. Um, and uh, so I was like, all right, I'm switching to pocket screws. And so I just decided to do pocket screws with the pocket holes facing in, and then I would fill them. With Bondo. I actually didn't do Bondo because I didn't want to be – Wearing a respirator for all of that work. Are you supposed to wear a respirator with Bondo? For Bondo? I, I, I feel like it gets me. I love the smell. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I, it's, it can't be good for you. It's no. not, I'm sure. But um, not. It smells fantastic. So I used uh, Durham's Rock Hard Putty. Oh, yeah. that's Water Putty. That's, Have you guys ever used that? That's old no. school. It's awesome. So when I sold that at the hardware store, the only people who asked for that were like 80 years old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it works awesome. I, it, I know. It, like you, you just it's a powder. You mix it with water. You paste it into the hole, and it hardens. And like, how? And, it, and what I was concerned about with using anything else was having to do it in layers. Sure. Because they're such deep. You know, the holes are are narrow, but they're deep, and so the inside doesn't want to cure. This was great. Come back a day later, and it's hard hard as a rock. <laughs> nice. We should get them, as, get them as a sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> and how long does it take to dry a day? Uh, it wasn't even that much, but I just, you know, I left for the night. Does it smell like back. anything? Is it Zero. a oh. I don't. I don't notice any smell whatsoever. God, I wonder what that is. I think the only complaint or the only thing they state on there is that it doesn't take stain well, uh-huh. but not a concern for me. Um, so after I had these things assembled, then I just use a rabbiting bit to do the backside. To make the, the shelf for the glass. Yep, yep. And, uh, 
I was talking to Matt with Matt at lunch the other day, and we were talking about options for setting the glass. I've done a lot of glazing. Um, you need glazing tape. Glazing tape is just the like, stuff that holds it. That just holds it into the groove, right? Yeah, I'm, but that's it's not, also an air seal too. Oh, you're saying just use that? Yeah. I was thinking I'm just gonna bed it in in silicone, mm-hmm. and then if that's not acceptable in terms of look, uh, which will be on the inside, yeah. you know, the glass will be facing in the groove. Um, then I can always, you know, cut up a stop and just, you know, it's two forty fives on either end, or you know, forty five on either end of each strip. You should slope it. But it'll be the inside. Yeah. Oh, oh, on the inside, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so the next step is hardware, and then painting, and then you know. how 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 will you fasten them to the building? So they have little hooks at the top that are on the outside. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. um, you know you kind of tilt it, latch it on, and then swing it into the opening. And then um, I'm either going to do little clasps on the outside, little rotating clasps, or um, hook and eyes on the inside is the other way. Yeah, or they have arms that you can use on the inside so that you can prop them open. I might use that. Because so you can get some ventilation when, yeah. you, when it's appropriate. I don't know. I mean, I've never – I don't have ventilation holes in my existing storms. Mm-hmm. I've never had a problem. No, it just means it allows you to open the window a little. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I maybe I'll do that on the ones that I know I'm going to open. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I haven't figured that part out yet. But it, it is moving along. Do you think this will be done in time for the heating season to be over? I, I do. I am <laughs> I am determined that it will be done in, in <laughs> December. <laughs> yes. It will be de- – by the end of December, you can check back with me. And where are you going to store these when they're not? I think because uh, I bet you've realized how much space it takes. I up. think the shed. Uh huh. Yeah, because I got a decent size, you know, twelve by sixteen shed. Um, you know, <laughs> the last big push is the glass. You said just looking at the price tag, going, I don't want to spend this money on glass. I'll have to, we'll have to do an analysis later on the uh, simple payback for your storm windows. It's like least sexiest project ever. You know. At least the, all the windows will match, and right? It's so boring to make. But the white pine was beautiful to work with. Loved it. Yeah. That was a good call. And yeah. something I didn't think about when we talked about it on here is the weight. Yeah. is like a huge storm window made out of white pine mm-hmm. is so light. Right. And poplar. And, It'll you know, be and much like when you're, when you're lifting it up and you're trying to find the little hooks to latch it, it, it starts to make a difference. But yeah. Cl- carrying them up a ladder, you know, that kind of stuff. So I hadn't thought of that. So I'm glad that I inadvertently landed there. My other suggestion was going to be... Um, some kind of exotic hardwood. <laughs> <laughs> God, can you imagine? I can't believe or you don't wear a respirator. Locust. I can't believe you don't wear a respirator for Bondo. <laughs> I didn't know you had to. They didn't, I mean, it's not even like a had to. It's, it's so obnoxious that I couldn't stand it. Like I don't know what you're talking right? about. <laughs> it's like, I it feel like it's going to knock me on my ass. Yeah. So I don't like, like gasoline smell. I don't like oil smell, diesel smell bad, but like the smell of Bondo, I don't know what it is. Solvents don't bother you. toluene or some other horrible yeah. thing. Yeah. I know. Can't be good for you. No. So what have you been doing? You went to do you Portland. Wear, do you wear gloves? When working with Bondo? Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> uh, you guys got to remember, I learned from the old school guys at the bus garage. You know, my first job was in the school district's bus garage and we prepped in uh masked buses for painting really yeah I used to blow yellow boogers out of my nose every day <laughs> <laughs> that was with wearing a respirator uh, um but yeah those guys they they had different rules for safety in in those days yeah guys mixing up like fiberglass with their finger and <laughs> that was bad. picking their nose <laughs> that's very bad yeah so you just got back from Portland. You were doing what there? Yeah, I just ran up real quick. Uh, they were this local, I don't know, it's like a discussion group. They talk about, like, performance building and, and things like that, and it's held at this performance building And we know some of these store. guys, right? They're yeah, contributors. We, yep, yeah. Mike Maines was there. Um, there's some other guys, Dan Colbert. Um, but anyway, the topic of the discussion this time was the uh, Pretty Good House 2.0 Low Carbon Diet Edition. Um, and so... Tell us briefly what Pretty Good House is for those folks who don't know. Yeah, so Pretty Good House, the idea there is they're just kind of trying to find the sweet spot between expenditures and gains. Like The way Dan had put it before was the best mix of affordability, comfort, and efficiency possible. Um, and there was some, I guess, attention paid even then to, you know, trying to 
Yeah, and mostly it was about making an energy efficient house, right, sort of like durable on a, and energy on a budget. Yeah. yeah. Um, this time they were trying to find ways to like really cut down on the carbon footprint of the of not just the building, but also you know the and the materials, but also like the way you build it. You know, like trying to basically cut down on the amount of driving you're doing to the site. Um, the How do you of, control that? Uh, well, just trying to be smart, you know, maybe having meetings ahead of time uh, was an idea, you know, like rather than just sort of like showing up and like every day trying to figure out what you're going to do, like spend a week before the build even begins and sort of like plan every phase, make sure that everything's set. Of course, I mean, the reality is that it's really hard sometimes because things don't show up when they're planned to. And Nothing things like happens that. when it's yeah. supposed to. And, and I mean, the, there's sort of like, you know, that's the reality of things. But, you know, essentially they're just trying to come up with ways to <laughs> minimize uh, like the builder's actual impact on the project as well. That wasn't the entire thing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, some guy pointed out they had sort of done an analysis of like how much gas or how much energy they were using going to and from the site every day and realized that, you know, even if they built this really efficient passive house or whatever, the amount of like carbon dioxide they were putting into the air, just, just like driving to, to and <laughs> from the job site every day, this whole crew was going to basically wipe out any gains they would have, you know, from this structure, you know, the payback, really? it, it, they could, yeah. Just driving. So they're not including like salamander heaters running in there. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, I think Trucks the analysis. Trucks idling in the driveway it, all this, day. Yeah. This wasn't specifically for a house. It, had, it was some other kind of thing, but, you know, it, the analysis they had done. What's but that it, uh, builder on Martha's Vineyard, uh, Justin, that's renowned? Gosh, what's their name? Uh, South Mountain Company? Yeah. They've done this study. And they, found that, yeah. and they found out that it was uh, one of the greatest carbon contributions was the getting to and from the job site. Yeah, because yeah. their stuff's coming on a ferry mm -hmm. across <laughs> so if you're an island. Yeah. So. <laughs> I yeah. Know, I, but if they got to come across on the ferry too, then everybody should camp out. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that could be a solution. Just in like, Portland, you know, renting, in a, renting an apartment <laughs> down the street, you know, for your yeah. crew. Maybe they'll love you know. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it was a lot of other stuff like that. Too. And it's also material, right? Yeah. Getting rid of like XPS foam because, you know, the HFC is used as a blowing agent and that mm -hmm. are, you know, way like, what is it, like 1200 times worse than carbon dioxide? I don't remember. It's way worse than carbon dioxide. Yeah. Yeah. So getting rid of that, you know, trying to just basically what should we get rid of and what can we use instead and they were just putting some thought into that what's the end goal will they, are they going to try and develop a standard uh, uh i don't think i think the whole point of this is not really having necessarily a standard it's just trying to figure out like a a i guess better alternatives and and you know there, there's it, it doesn't seem like there's a cookie cutter approach with the right. with a pretty good house movement or whatever you want to call it yeah even that is not really like a, a rule book that you point to i guess that that was sort of the point is that it would always be it would always shift like as the building codes uh, you know as passive house got tighter or building codes moved up this thing would shift along with it it would just be like a scaled back version like a happy medium yeah i think that yeah. i i think <clears throat> the intent was to make a performance standard that made sense Right. Yeah. That wasn't arbitrary and with regard to its uh, BTU consumption. You know, it was like this is this makes sense. This is the, the scale yeah. that we should be shooting for. And I for. think most of Some what of we talk about arbitrary. on the podcast <laughs> and in the magazine is it's would, pretty would good. Be, would be a pretty good house kind <laughs> yeah. of a standard. Yeah, but one one big one. I mean, the amount of carbon that's sort of put out just in the production of Portland cement yeah. is like is a big one. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike Maines had brought up. You know, you can supplement or or replace, I guess, up to 50% of the Portland cement with fly ash or other pozzolans. And if you specify that, I mean, you're going a long way toward, you know, I've always wondered how you foundation. said that word. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Um, Mike Maines wrote a whole thing on this whole topic. This, you know, climate change for builders was what we called it, but it was really about, you know, thinking critically about the materials you're using and that type of stuff and alternatives. And uh, Rob, Rob can put a link to it on the show notes page for this episode. That's a fascinating subject, and yeah. I don't think people realize how much energy goes into home building. It is uh, one of the biggest uh, consumers of energy. Yeah, I the... think it was. Uh, I can't remember the stat, but it was something like, resi or, or sorry, con the construction building industry uh, produces more 
carbon dioxide or has a more harmful effect than transportation and industrial combined. I believe it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, even the smallest construction project, just think about how much more garbage you generate. Just like that alone does it for me. Like, Do you remember, was, was it Fernando? Remember Fernando Pages Ruiz, who was, was he the one who was an advocate for designing houses so that they were on a, a two foot two foot grid? I think lots of people have proposed that. Really? But it, it either works on the outside or the inside. It right. doesn't work both. Right. I mean, there's, and there, you end up with odd compromises. It, it, again, it's one of those, like, you've saved less, you saved plywood in the, in the dumpster, but now you have, now you have, have drywall, dry, or, drywall or, or you have baseboard or, yeah. or yeah. it's, it's a tricky thing to figure out, but I do kind of like that thinking that way. Like, how do I make the most use of my material? I find that like using scrap and salvage materials really cuts down on stuff like using two by fours over again and trim over again. And like that, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And it's cheap. Yeah. But it burns so good too. And that's also, <laughs> I don't think that's sequestering carbon. <laughs> so I've been working on my uh, closets still, and I haven't mm. made a lot of progress, but uh, last night I got home from work uh, a little early, and I drywalled. This is the uh, bedroom side of my closet assembly, and this I closed off. And it's not exciting at all, except to say that this is the first time I used the Fibafuse uh, mm. joint tape. And you love it. That is fantastic. I have honestly not used a product that was so much better than anything yep. else I've ever used. Yep. Yeah. When I ripped out the drywall on that one wall, and I, I, I had done it originally with paper tape, and I think that was part of the problem. And I went back and I redid it. When I redid it, I did it with five fuse. Can't really use it on the inside corners. It doesn't work real great there. But yeah, let's yeah, talk about that. But before we flats. get any further, let's tell yeah. folks what this is. So this is a fiberglass joint tape. And it's not woven, unlike the old school uh, mesh tapes. Um, and it's really thin, which to me is the greatest attribute because it makes butt seem so much less obvious because it's half as thick as paper tape. Yeah, I don't even know how would you describe it. It's, I guess, a non-woven fiberglass, right? Yeah, it looks kind of like a cobwebby. Yeah. yeah, it's like if a coffee filter was a lot less dense. Yes. Because you can really kind of see through it. And yeah. it doesn't feel good. Like, my son was curious about it, and he hates fiberglass, like, with a passion. And he's like, okay, I'm going to boil my hand now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I've, I've gotten itchy from it. That is a downside. Yeah, it feels a little crunchy almost. I, so you tell me about the corners because that was the one thing that I was I did not do in this little patch. So yeah, what's I, the problem? I'm with Matt on this too. You it, when you put any pressure on the knife, you'll cut right through it. So yeah. okay, when so you the, go to the, ed, the corner of the knife cuts through it in the corner. Yeah, yes. very very easily. Right. It's hard. Okay. It's hard to fold it really into a great corner in the first place, and then yeah, it's like you just nick it and it roll tear. Yeah. And paper tape works great in inside corners anyway, yep. so that's not a, an issue. But I love this stuff, and I learned – I went looking on the interweb about um, – I said to myself, I was like, well, the times I have had to patch plaster in my life, this would have been a godsend. And they do make a 36-inch uh, wide product for that application. I so roll my office. <laughs> you do? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, we have a whole article on that. I forget who did it. Um but that was where I first heard of this product, and I don't might, might not be the same brand, um, but that was it. It was some it was a the guy that works out in Newport area who does a lot of painting and restoration and oh, that kind of stuff. I know stuff. Who you're I talking forget, about. I forget name, his but, name too. Um, Tim Leahy is that who it is? Yeah, I think it um, is. But anyway, he, so he, they make the wide rolls, and so you can skim coat the walls, and then pr or press this stuff in, or either put it up first and then skim coat it. I don't know. Did you, did you, which way did you do it? Did you stick it on the wall and then so skim coat I, it? I put a bed down like I would for paper tape. Yeah. I embedded the tape in it, and then I smoothed it out. Because I can't remember. And does the great thing about it, No, there's it no adhesive. Okay. It, no. The great thing about it is you can work it much more easily than you can a conventional seam. Like, if you decide later on you want to go back and add a little more compound because of a low spot, it's not an issue. Yeah, and it does, there's no bubbles because it... Because the, the compound, compound goes, goes right through it. Through. Right. Oh, it's so cool. It's a, I think it's supposed to be even stronger than, than paper, too. But I'm not, I might be so, misquoting that. I, the I first time I saw this was uh, Drywall Nation, Nick Atchison and Brian Kitchen up there in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. And um, they use it everywhere um, in their t automatic taping. Um, what do you call that thing? Bazooka. Bazooka. Um, and I, I thought it looked cool, but I was scared because I've used paper tape forever and didn't want to try it. But this seemed like a right project, and I love it. So it's Fiberfuse 
F I B A F U S E, and it's made by Certainteed or Saint Gobain, which is the same company. Um, I would say if there are concerns about inside and outside corners while you're buying this, you should pick up some No Coat, N O dash C O A T. So um, I've never used that either. It's essentially like a rigid. It comes in a roll, which is what's unique about it, I think. And you you put this um, in a bed coat? Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's rock hard, so you can do inside corners, outside corners. And what's the advantage of that, Justin? Uh, I, You know what? Now that you're calling me out on it, I think you don't have to do a bed coat, and that's the advantage. Hmm. Make pleasant conversation. Yeah. I'm going to look it up. <laughs> look it up. <laughs> So had you used this before that, your pr- yeah, uh, closet project? Yeah, so we had ripped out the entire ceiling in the living room when we very first moved into the house last year. And, uh, yeah, used Five of Fuse on all, I think on all of the butts. I'm not 100%. I can't remember exactly. And I know we initially started to try to use it in the corners, and that's how I Decided learned. you don't like it. Oh, yeah, it was actually my girlfriend doing most of that work, and it, it ripped immediately, and she was like, nope. So, yeah, I went back <laughs> to the paper tape for I bet that. it would work fine if you had the double-sided trowel, which I hate carrying another trowel, but... Yeah, possibly. This stuff, I, I mean, it, it you can rip it pretty easily, too. I mean, you know, just with your hands. I, I was using my rip. knife to cut it, like, you know, the taping knife, like you do paper tape. Yeah, you just kind of put it against right, it and pull and the tape it. and then tear it just sort of like a tape dispenser. Um, and it does tear very easily that way as well. But yeah, the nice thing, because the compound does come right through it, you don't have like really any risk of bubbling unless you didn't put enough compound down like you do with I don't paper see, tape. Cause you, but you could put it on Yeah, over it, you know? Like, yeah. But the, the main, one of the greatest advantages, it seemed like, cause when I, and this is another thing. So when I initially ripped out that drywall and tried to put in new drywall, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, again, used paper tape, and I left it on there for about an hour, and it started, there were kind of big cracks. This this whole thing is kind of a mess, it, like going into it exactly yeah. <laughs> in full detail would be really boring. Um, but the, <laughs> when that compound starts to shrink, like it was sort of distorting the paper in like all these different directions and sure. making such a mess. I've seen that when you have, uh, you're going over holes. Yeah, I know mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Yeah, and so that was, you know. It was creating problems, and I didn't have that same problem with the five fuse. Even though it was getting sucked back into some of the cracks, mm-hmm. um, it it wasn't distorting at the edges and and sort of like puckering up the way the paper was. So that's I I love this stuff, and you know, like oftentimes, if nothing else, the like price is what makes something you know unrealistic. But you know, at four bucks for a two hundred and fifty foot roll, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is that compared to paper? I was thinking about that, and I, and I have no idea, but, like, that means paper must be, what, $2, right? It's really cheap. Yeah. yeah it may be somewhere in that vicinity. <laughs> so I was delighted with that. What were you doing? I forget. I was trying to figure out the no-coat thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should come back to that, maybe? <laughs> I remember I really like it, but then I... You don't know why. Yeah. Tack that on at the end. But I think you can use it for interior or exterior corners. Um, you mean inside or outside? Not interior or exterior. Sorry. Well, they, sorry. I'm re- the thing I'm reading is calling them interior, interior and exterior. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Like when you read something written by somebody who has no clue about what they're talking I about. <laughs> I know. Uh, Should we get to a question? Yeah, it'd be fine. Yeah. Save me. This one is uh, from Matt Stern of Huntington, New-, New York. Do you guys know where that is? Long Island. Okay. Next to Sayoset. That's close to here. Matt knows where it is. Yep. Hello, fine home building. I've been working on homes for more than 40 years. This is a good question. When the fastener industry transitioned from using slotted head screws to Phillips head, I thought this was a godsend. I could finally use my corded drill to drive them without the slotted bit walking off the screw head. What an improvement, or so I thought. However, even with the advent of a cordless drill driver and finally the cordless impact driver, the Phillips fastener still presents a problem. They were designed for the driver bit to cam out at a certain point. This happens more often than you can imagine in my work. I see it every day, and it's quite frustrating to deal with stripped screws. And even with a new bit, a new screw, and an impact driver, and putting my full 200-plus pound weight against the screw, the bit can still come out. This doesn't happen with combo Phillips square heads, nor square heads or star slash Torx drive fasteners. The automotive industry has been converting from uh, Phillips for years, Kitchen hardware manufacturers have converted to posi drive. I think he's talking about like cabinet hinges and stuff like that. Yep. It kind of looks like Phillips, but it's not. And the decking industry uses square and star drive head screws. 
which none of which came out. So why are Phillips head screws still being used, and when can we expect to see this type of fastener put out to pasture? Mm. <laughs> Probably uh, never. You're, you're reading this. I hope you have an answer for it because uh, yeah. your guess is as good as mine. Well, so I... I, at first, when I got this question, I'm like, well, this is kind of a silly question because I don't see Phillips head screws anymore. But if you think about it, door hinges, doorknobs, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, tra- uh, hardware for of all types, yeah. uh, like bath accessories, plumbing fixtures and all use Phillips head screws. And yeah. it's o- obviously the wrong thing. Well, Dry- drywall screws still, too, for the most part. Too, I mean, you yeah. can get square drive. But, but the... At least a drywall screw, it's meant to strip, right? Right. At the right depth. Yeah. Well, and that's the reason, I think, why they use Phillips and a lot of those other things, too. Because, like, it, when you're hanging hinges, if you overdrive that screw, like, there's nothing else you can do. I mean, <laughs> if that thing tears out of that jam, which is probably pine. Right. You know, then, like, it's not like you can then draw, put a longer screw in, because most of the time those things are going to go into the drywall, which is going to give you no no purchase at all. Wait, what are you talking about? Like, so, like, when you're hanging door hinges, yeah. like, if you, like, at least where mine are, um, I can get one long screw in the one hole that's sort of, like, farthest away, yeah, yeah. you know, from the wall. But the other two, if they were to go beyond the jam... There's no framing back there. There's no framing back there. It's, they would it's go drywall. Into the, they're too it's close drywall. to the edge. But yeah, why is that? I mean, edge. could you possibly overdrive a screw in that situation? It's going to bottom out on the hinge and stop. Uh, no, well, or you'd it, strip it. it. Yeah, even yeah. if you bottomed out on the hinge, if... If you had a, like, say you had a torque screw in there, yeah. that thing will keep spinning whether it bottoms out or not, and then it'll, it'll just break. tear all that wood out, and then yeah. it'll have gotcha. no hold. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's why sort of Phillips screws still exist is because in a lot of these, in a lot of these applications, you want them to, to cam out. You wanted to, yeah. Yeah, and they're designed to cam out. Like, they don't have straight walls like the, the no, bits themselves like they're engineered right. so that the, I, the I'm told they were like, invented for the automotive industry where they wanted uh, the yeah. uh, drivers to be able to stop at that torque mm-hmm. yeah and they act there were as far as i understand the robertson bit was invented before that so that has actually been around quite a bit longer i think it was a canadian invention and ford used to use that on like the original like on some of their older cars and then get out yeah apparently so <laughs> and then did they use star drive too no i don't know <laughs> if they use star drive but i think that also may have been a mo- an automotive thing but i'm not 100 remember sure. square bolts for mud sills you ever run into those in old houses my square house heads? has that i think yes yeah, yeah. and those i had fun yeah. i was rebuilding a <laughs> family heirloom which is a dining room table that had square headed lag screws mm-hmm. and i've thrown away all my 12 point sockets and i was just like how the heck am I going to tighten this thing? Slowly. <laughs> it was a drag, I um, gotta say. Uh, it's interesting, though, is do you guys have, um, like, hand screwdrivers that are Torx and Robertson? Yeah. Torx, I don't, yes, I don't no have Robertson. Torx. I think I have a couple of square drive screwdrivers, but mm-hmm. it's funny that, like, the Phillips heads hang on, and the only hand screwdrivers I have are or also Phillips. Phillips. Yeah. And, you know, and slotted, you know, yeah, for slotted screws, but... Slotted can go right in the garbage, though. I mean, I don't see a reason for that. I, I, <laughs> if I'm salvaging stuff and those are in, I throw them away. Mm-hmm. They're still on light switches and electrical stuff. I know. Well, but I, it's for some, and some cabinet, why is that? cabinet hinges, I don't know. Yeah. Apparently, that is still... And high-end hardware often has straight... Yep, uh, totally. ...straight screws. Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's like a throwback look thing. I don't know. You got to uh, clock those screws, though. Yeah. If you got if you, <laughs> like, which, when you do electrical outlets with the slotted, do you like them to be horizontal, vertical, or you don't bother? So <laughs> I never bothered, but my wife makes me make them all the same now. But which way? I don't remember. I go vertical. I That's would, so any water can drip down. Yeah. <laughs> Get better, better air performance. Yeah. You don't want to block convective loops. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we had an answer for you, Matt, but... Um, I don't think I don't think they're going away, and I would, you know, you can buy other screws. Yeah, throw away your yeah. Phillips screws. But like, I was taking apart the you know bifold door hardware on my closet project recently, and I was like, okay, these things still are everywhere. I will go so far out of my way to not buy them, though. Like, I will look at a box of screws, perfect length, perfect finish, and go, I'm not buying these because they're Phillips. Mm-hmm. Especially if they're like framing applications and stuff. It is absolutely terrible. It yeah. is just a dreadful There's nothing thing. worse than like a three and a half or four inch <sighs> drywall Phillips yes. screw. Like, yes. Forget it. Yes. It'll just, you're not even going to get all the way in before it breaks or. So I haven't been building or, yeah. as long as uh, Matt has uh, our letter, our email writer, but I remember 
um, those three and, and a half inch construction screws, either the black phosphate or the galvanized as being the only thing you could get for a long time. Yeah. But they were wonderful at the time, but now they just, they're terrible. The worst part is when you're really pushing on that screw and the driver bit goes into oh. your, into your finger on the other hand. Uh huh. Yeah. Right yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. I've got at least two of those. <laughs> That's from a Phillips. <laughs> yeah. I've had bruises that were like star shaped on my t- oh, fingertips. It, it just, mm-hmm. and it goes in, and the, the bit gets in your skin, and it's still spinning. It just, <laughs> it's it just so... shreds. Mm hmm. So let's try and get a question that we can actually do something about. <laughs> <laughs> this is from F. Ponzani of Northeast Ohio. I want to add some heat in my garage. I'm looking at the Procom brand ventless gas heaters sold by Northern Tool and Harbor Freight, amongst others. These are sheet metal units that can be mounted on the wall. They come in two flavors, radiant, heats objects, and blue flame heats the air in the room. I generally understand the difference between the two, but I've been unable to find anybody who can tell me the pros and cons of each type as related to heating an attached garage. I want to keep the temp in the 40s or low 50s and just turn it up when I'm working on a project in the garage. Which is preferred? I'm curious. that I didn't realize the Harbor Freight sold heaters. So I went looking on Harbor Freight's website, and like I couldn't find them $12? either. dollars No, I couldn't find them either. So I don't know if it just – there was maybe another brand or what have you that he saw. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what this gentleman is talking about is a sheet metal box, as he suggests, with a burner in it. And one of them is a radiant heater like you see at the big box store near the door, and it uh, is usually – hanging from the ceiling mm-hmm. you were big talking orange glow yeah the big yeah. orange glowing de- uh square and then the other kind is a uh forced air heater it's got a burner in there and a fan and it's heating up air and blowing it out the other end <clears throat> so right do you guys uh have a preference f- for this are they uh, radiant is always going to be electric right Mm-mm, these it's are not, gas both of them are gas? Or propane yeah Gas or propane. I have my opinion is don't do either of these then. Yeah. What's what's your opinion? <laughs> yeah, I mean you should. This is what the Building Science Corporation refers to as the Kevorkian option of putting <laughs> uh, putting uh, unvented uh, unvented gas appliances so that's the problem in a here, closed right? space. So there are vented models, uh, and so this is a vented one we're showing. Mm-hmm. This is an unvented. So that means that the combustion gases are just blown into the room as right. part of it. and the, all of this nonsense about, like... Oh, this is actually the unvented one, and the other one was vented. So you can get them both, but you don't want an unvented one for... Well, yeah, I mean, these people are, are, you know, the companies that sell them are like, well, they're perfectly safe. They have, they CO, have these, they have these CO, sensors that CO will CO shut sensors. off if yeah. the oxygen dips down. It's like, well, well, there's no magic involved. You're burning fuel. <laughs> it's going somewhere. In your lungs. Yeah, so, yeah. like... Unless you're proving to me that somehow you've solved that problem, there's combustion byproducts in my house. Yes. Yeah. Or in my garage in this case. And uh, they're outlawed it, in, like, t- in like several states. You can't put them in Canada. I will, I will read you a list. Of, yeah. This is the, the most recent that I've read. It's <laughs> They're outlawed in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. In the U.S., it's illegal in California and Montana. Minnesota has a statewide ban prohibiting them in any home built after 1980. And then you have countywide bans in Arizona, Colorado, Washington, Kansas, Wyoming, Ohio, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nevada, New Mexico, Alaska, <laughs> Minnesota, Texas, and New Hampshire. I mean, if they're banned in Australia, that tells you something because everything there Montana. Can kill <laughs> it's banned in Montana. Yeah, I mean, it's like there's no never buy this. Yeah. Even in your garage, like which, unless you're unless you're willing to leave a window open while you're heating. Which is, but the moisture is still which a case, problem. Go with the radiant. But the, well, then you have the window open, <laughs> yeah. so it's partially. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Just get an electric resistance heater, or a gas heater that's vented, right? Yes, that's. But I mean, if this guy's, ta- I mean, what wasn't clear to me, and what's not clear because I don't know enough about these heaters, is this a portable unit we're talking about? No, or it's it's, like it's kind of it's, okay. It's screwed to the ceiling, so, and you don't take it out. So up at our up our project house we used to have here, we had an electric resistance yes. heater that was like the ones you'd see in a big box store or, you know, pointing down at the cashiers and at the door. Totally. And it was just a giant radiant electric heater with a fan. It was like a giant toaster. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that is loud and, and sucks up watts. I understand. But won't it, kill you. He, yeah. he want, might not want that because electricity might be too expensive, right? So you can get a similar thing that is vented, that is gas, yep. that'll do the same thing. I would also consider a mini split, like we're totally. always suggesting. Um, I'm getting one for my garage. That's my plan. I use so, a wood stove right now. How, how much is that, though? This thing is like 150 bucks or I something know. like that, what it he is, was looking at. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. is really cheap. It's pretty cheap. And yeah. that is a, a plus, right? Yeah. 
the, <laughs> the, the thing he has is he's going to keep the thing in the 40s or low 50s. So um, you're going to want something that heats the air because uh, a radiant type heater is not going to heat the things fast enough for you to get comfortable. So you, you want yeah. something to heat the air. That's, yeah. that's the downsize with the wood stove. It's like you could have that thing on cranking up the air at 80 all day and the table saw is tabletop still is still freezing. ice cold and you, so you still got risk of condensation everywhere yeah it's not so i you might want to keep it just a little warmer um i think in the 50s you'll definitely solve the condensation condensation problem carhartt in insulated bib overalls are are a godsend yeah by the way <laughs> or oh, Carl yeah. patrick's whatever m12 m18 heated jacket that's something else <laughs> and that is way it's actually probably more expensive than the gas space yeah, heater. I think yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I have the DeWalt. It's awesome. Yeah. That was a good question. But yeah, don't kill yourself. It's not worth $150. It's not worth the savings. Isn't it amazing that we still sell these in this country? It is. A, I wrote about this topic years ago, and it was my first year at the magazine. And we did this department called What's the Difference? When was that, Justin? Just to say that like this conversation has been going on for how many years? That was two th We wrote it in 2005. Um, and I remember really, really stressing over this thing because it was like, we didn't have a lot of space and we had to be kind of fair and balanced. So we presented <laughs> What's the balance. <laughs> well, we, well, they sell them and people, people are yeah. buying them. So, yeah. so we needed to present it. Right. So we talked about vent free. We talked about ventless and went out the door. As soon as it went out to the readers, the first letter we got back was from somebody from the vent free mm -hmm. Like uh, you know, associate you know, trade association totally pissed off sure. that we that that we didn't give them like the the right we didn't we didn't we didn't mention all of the safety systems they have in place that will save you and all this stuff. I was like, oh god, I'm gonna get fired. Then the second letter we get in is from somebody who's pissed off that we even bothered to talk to about them. Ventless, and I'm sitting there, and I'm the editor at the time, Kevin, comes in. And he's standing there looking at the two letters, and I'm just sitting there squirming. <laughs> and he reads them both, and he looks at me and goes, good job. Looks, yep, looks like we did our job. <laughs> yeah. And that was it. And it's, you know, so this has been going on for a long time. Yeah. Back then, they were outlawed in California, at least. I don't remember the rest of the details, but. So my first discussion with this was in the early 90s when we were talking about, um, so I was working for Habitat for Humanity at the time as a construction supervisor. And we were, we've always put, had always put gas ranges in because they're way less expensive to operate for people than electricity. But the conversation was, you know, most gas ranges are not vented to the outside. So mm -hmm. the question was, should we be doing this? And so that was uh, my first introduction to the topic. So it's yeah, we're still doing it with, with gas stoves on the regular. Yeah. I mean, hopefully people have a range hood that they're using with their gas stove, but you don't have to, right? Yeah. I, I'm able to switch to gas. I have electric right now, and I'm able to switch to gas, and I go back and forth because there's something nice about a gas stove. Oh, yeah. But I also don't want to turn on a range hood every time I'm cooking something. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, con convective is really interesting to me, the convective technology. Yeah, that, you're talking about a uh, cooktop. Yeah, did I yeah. say convective? Conduction, Conduction. Right? Induction. 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 Yeah. Is it induction? Induction. I think induction. All right. Convection like, is a That's what I said. I said induction. Yeah. You guys just heard me wrong. <laughs> um, those are super cool. Yeah. They're still super expensive. Yes. But super cool. I've never cooked on one, so I'd love to try it. We it's have got, a... They got like that sensing technique. You can just like put it wherever you want on the cooktop, and it'll just like you just rearrange all your pots and pans, and it'll mm. just like, you know, you got a pot here, I'll cook here. And then it won't burn and, you. Yeah, right? and you can touch it, and it's yeah. not hot. How does that work? Because it like excites the electrons in a pot or something. Yeah. With what, a little song? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a small world. It does a little dance for it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Dan from northern Wisconsin, Zone 7. So do you know where Zone 7 is? Really cold. That's all I know. <laughs> it's cold. Yeah, he's There's, probably... There is one part of country that's Zone 8. Do you know where that is? It's got to be like Fairbanks or something, right? You want to take a guess? I have no idea. It's the north slope of Alaska. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's like... Not the top of Mount Washington? What is that? That doesn't count. Nobody lives there. <laughs> I don't think there is a zone 10, but that would be it. <laughs> so this is really cold is the point we're making here. I'm insulating a new cabin, zone 7, northern Wisconsin. The cabin is 20 by 26 with a monolithic slab, electric baseboard heat. It's 2 by 6 wall construction, one and a half stories. The exterior walls have flash and bat insulation and two inches of XPS, I presume, on the exterior, and R19 on the rest of the cavity. I used attic trusses in order to give me a storage 
and overflow yeah. sleeping room. A Bessler pull down stairway. Do you know what that that is? No, I don't either. Oh, wait, that sounds familiar. I think it's the. I think it's just like super insulated attic stairs and I th- attic, attic hatch. Yeah, I think it um, is sturdier than most of them. Yeah, um, and will provide access to the upstairs attic slash sleeping room. Yes, I am insulating the Devil's Triangle as you can see from the attached pick. Blocking has been installed, and the R thirty eight bats are in the ceiling. All right, so this is a guy who gets how to build a cape, I got to say. So when he's First talking... Of, I've never heard of it called a devil's triangle, I and, I, yeah, and but, I love it. I love it, too. <laughs> it explains the space behind the knee wall and above the second-story floor that is typically detailed very poorly and an energy hog, yep. right? So here's the question. Uh, the upstairs attic loft space will probably be used less than 15% for kids sleeping or extra place to get away. During the winter, temps can get 20 below. 20 below. Yeah, this... <laughs> I love it. I plan on keeping the heat at 50, even if no one is in the cabin during the winter. Would there be any benefit to insulating the attic floor, first floor ceiling, while the bottom truss court is still exposed? This is an 11 by 26 area between the upstairs knee walls. The thought is to keep the electric heat down when mo- most of the time when the attic upstairs is not being used. Then, if the upstairs is used with a pull-down stair and the insulated roof line, the upper half of the cabin can be heated or cooled. I'm so I gotta like wrap my head around all these details. Yeah. So he his normal thermal barrier is at the roof line, right? He's insulating the roof. He's insulating the roof. He's insulating the Devil's Triangle. So his thermal barrier includes the upstairs space. His the, quest- the, the walls of the triangle he's doing. Yes. The, the knee walls he's insulating. Yes. Okay. And so the question is, does it make sense to insulate the part that's not yet insulated? So he could separate the second story from the first story to heat less space. Mm. Hmm. Right? And he's not talking about a lot of uh, insulation. It's 11 by 26, so approximately 300 square feet of insulation. So this is, yeah, okay. So this is like more like a comfort cost savings thing, less of a help me insulate my building to perform. Yeah, he gets the insulation yeah, part. Yeah. He's What he's asking is do I make it into two zones? I don't know. Matt was shaking his head about the... The exterior foam and the fl- and the, <laughs> yeah, the foam whole, on the inside. I, like, I'm not sure because he said exterior walls are flash and bat with two inches XPS and R19 compressed into the rest of the cavity, which makes me think that he's basically sort of used like a cut and cobble approach for the XPS. No, the XPS is it. on the exterior. You can see yeah. the bats here. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is it seems like he d- like took two inches of XPS and just cut it and then put it in there and then put the crushed the 19 R19 bats on top of that. And he's calling that. Flash and, flash and bat, which it's not. Oh, okay. That's your concern? Is yeah. it just a terminology thing? I, or the fact that he's got a sandwich between well, insulation I, I don't know layers? Well, I don't know what the advantage is there of doing that. I mean, well, you, if he sealed it in place. If he sealed it in place, yeah, then, then sure. But, I mean, then compressing those R19 bats, he's probably still just got, <laughs> like, not much more than R19 in that wall. Well, the XPS is R8 anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two inches. So, yeah. I mean. Oh, R10. You get for that, yeah. 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 So I think I don't think that's the the issue. I, w- I was more concerned about the terminology and what he was uh, like because uh, he didn't really describe what that okay. was exactly. Well, let's assume it's that. <laughs> this is what you, you listen. Dan sends us a question. We're going to answer everything else that he didn't want to know, like yeah. why he has way too many trimmers on that window in the attic. Yeah, and if you have trusses and why do you have a load bearing wall framing? That's what I was trying to figure out. The size of that header. On yeah. that non-load bearing wall, can you I saw guys, that picture, and I was like, you guys what the heck are you doing? <laughs> imagine his snow load, though. Yeah, but that's a non-load bearing wall. There's I absolutely know. no weight on that window. Yeah, it only the, the snow only piles up above the top plate of that wall. Right. <laughs> hey, look how many studs he's got. Come on, man. See, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, like, we're, we're really just, you know, it's because I wasn't listening to you. I was looking at that picture. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to then ask what the question is after. Okay. So, yes, if, if the area <clears throat> is smaller than the roof, I would say it makes sense, right? If, if the equivalent area is the same as the second-story roof surface area, no, it wouldn't make sense. I would say yes, depending on how much insulation you're going to put in the floor versus the attic. Mm-hmm. See, so, yeah, I mean, this attic is just for storage? Do we, did he... He, he mentioned it might be for overflow sleeping. Okay. So he's mostly not using it, though. That's the point. Well, then, so what is the problem with not 
So when he insulates the first floor ceiling, mm -hmm. it, uh, we're assuming there's still heat running to the upstairs, though. Like it's just maybe dialing it back, so it's not. He as said that warm. they would leave the stair open and it would so be heated and cooled that way. I don't see much benefit to it, honestly. It looks like a small place. I mean, maybe I can't tell from the photos, and I don't love the idea of your of your upstairs being freezing, freezing cold, or, or at risk of freezing because. Mm -hmm because of the fact that it's negative 900 degrees outside at all times in zone seven. <laughs> and, the, and if there were any air leaks, right, and that Big time problems. attic is cold, it's going to be condensing surfaces up there. Yeah, I don't... Uh, so you have to either be super meticulous in your air, air sealing, and that uh, pull-down stair has to be super airtight as well. Did he say, oh, main cabin's 20 by 26? Yeah, this is a small space. I mean, I don't... I can't imagine there's going to be that much of a benefit, especially if you're leaving this attic hatch open. It's going to be warm up there. Yeah. So even you, you insulate the floor and then you leave a door open. It's Well, he, he, ordinarily the door would be closed. Yeah. Right. It would only be open when they wanted to use the space. But it's okay. A, yeah. yeah. And that's the only, so no extra heat up there. Right. right. I'm asking Patrick, like, like, I know. like he knows all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> and if I have an answer, then yeah. we can just move on, right? Yeah. <laughs> I plan on keeping the heat at 50, even if no one's in the cabin during the winter. But he doesn't – the thought is to keep electric heat costs down when most of the time the upstairs attic doesn't need to be conditioned. That's what worries me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the whole place should be conditioned if it's going to be inside the conditioned envelope. There you but go. But that's my – And I would say it's just not enough difference to worry about it. Yeah, like I mean, the, I, the amount of square footage of the second floor floor versus the roof uh, is going to be minimal. And, yeah. and like if we didn't, if, if you know, if Dan has already done this, like it looks like he's under construction. Maybe he made the call to insulate the floor. I don't think it's gonna like really make a huge. No, it's hurt. just gonna cost him a few hundred bucks. Yeah, it's not gonna do much. Probably it's gonna take decades probably to get that money back. Yeah, you know, it might help with noise, right? It might make mm -hmm. their space that. a little quieter. Mm -hmm. Noisy kids. And if I he, worry a little bit about having people <laughs> sleeping up there with a pool downstairs. That's one thing that kind of worried me. But Ugh, going to the bathroom is going to be so well, hard in the middle it, of the it night. Could, you know, I don't, <laughs> those are not code compliant as means of egress. So remember yeah. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Chevy Chase got stuck up in the attic for a while because somebody closed the attic. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. What was he doing up there? Was he hiding? He was hiding a present. Yeah. <laughs> and he was in an unconditioned attic. <laughs> I can't saying. wait till that's on again. That'll be on like twenty four hours a day. <laughs> What do we got next? So you'll never guess who this is. I think it's you. <laughs> this is Patrick from <laughs> Southwest Connecticut. <laughs> I have to build some new closet organizers for an upcoming project. I'm going to be brutal on this. <laughs> A local supplier has both pre-finished plywood and melamine. The plywood is available in several, several species and finishes. What should I use to build the closet shelves and cubbies? They also have pre-primed plywood. Keeping in mind, I'd rather have oral surgery than paint cabinet boxes. What should I use? This is shedding some serious light on you coming up to me yesterday and asking if I had a paint sprayer. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then said, have you ever used it for painting cabinets? <laughs> uh, what do you use to make your build-ins? I've used all sorts of things. I've used unfinished birch kind of plywood, then primed and painted. I've used... Um, so you bought pre-painted? plywood no no, no. Oh. unfinished birch i've okay. bought primed birch okay i've bought um pre-finished maple and i've bought mdo which has a nice craft paper overlay that stuff takes paint great too expensive and um mdf whatever i've used it all what what should i use well i don't know what's the look you're going after how much you want to spend pre-finished plywood is expensive what 80 bucks a sheet really that cheap i think so half inch or three quarter three quarter that's pretty cheap that's really cheap is yeah. it finished both sides? Yep. I mm. mean, it's not a great uh, plywood, but it's also <laughs> inside a closet. You know what I mean? It's yeah. going to be rotary cut. It's not going to be straight grain. It still seems cheap. That yeah. seems really cheap. Yeah. I mean, so I should use that. I don't see why not. I mean, I a mean, good sheet of plywood, like good meaning, you know, good quality, is going to cost you 75 80 bucks a sheet anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you can get good plywood that's pretty finished, yeah. I don't love melamine. I don't like moving it. I don't like working with uh, it. Cutting it is horrible. I don't like fastening it. Yes, it's terrible. I don't terrible. like anything about it, really. It's cheap. I like that part. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only... Why is why are all closet organizers made of that stuff, Because it's cheap. Because yeah. nobody ever sees it. Yeah. And 
because they can do that <laughs> thermal foil lamination stuff on it. You know, it's mm-hmm. so edge do you, banding. Do you drill like a gazillion shelf pins in everything, or do you just like kind of set it up the way you want and assemble it like a? It depends. Okay. Well, I, what, I, I, on I what? Mean, the answer for me is you should think about it. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just whether I want to think about it. You know, I would love to be at the level where everything is that planned out. And how do you make those holes? Do you um, have the Festool hole maker? No. I have very little Festool stuff. I work in a magazine. I know. <laughs> um, I have not bring it to your local CNC shop and have them put them in. I'm really temp- tempted to start using some stuff from a CNC shop. They they do sell some MDF made for closets that's already pre-drilled for, for shelf pins. Pre-finished? It's, it's, well, it's <laughs> melamine. Okay. Um, you know, like just go into the closet aisle of the home center and there's probably some stuff in there. Um, so you can buy kind of separate components, buy and, some shells, buy some dividers. And then you mat this stuff together or whatever? Uh, I think probably. So conformat screws are like a dowel screw, and they're used commonly in uh, European-style cabinetry, right? Did I say that? Does that seem like... I don't know. Are they dowel-type screws? They they're look just like kind of da- like fat Yeah, they look like screws. Top, yeah. They get a better, better bite in that kind of crappy... Right, they're like meant to board. hold crappy things together. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. I think IKEA furniture yeah, yeah, is basically exactly. what they're very commonly um, seen in. I don't know. I mean, I like a painted closet myself. I wouldn't want it painted by hand. I want to spray it. There's some problems associated with that because you have to. You're spraying into a dead space. Yes. So you're going to get a lot, a lot of bounce overspray. Back. Um, you also have to mask off a lot of stuff. So I get why you might not want to do that. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's inside the house, right? And I, I'm going to have to build these in place, there's, or at least com- components assemble them in place. There's not a lot of need for like scrubability in a bedroom closet. Like a kitchen pantry. If it was for my son, different. I would say there needs to be that, but not for me. <laughs> so, um, and the rest of the look in your house, like white, pa- painted, painted white, colonist uh, hollow cord molded doors. Uh, you know, it's cheap. It's uh, builder grade. Totally builder grade. Was it Windsor casing? They call it. Uh huh. Well, then in that case, I don't, wouldn't have too much of a problem with melamine, except the fact that it's a pain in the butt I have to, to work, work with it, yeah. right? And spans, I mean, I don't know what kind of shelves you're going to have saggy. there. The spans are going to be really short. So we'll have two closets. I think they'll both be four foot wide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd have to have some sort of oh, mid-span yeah. I'm going to have to anyway with probably. plywood too. Yeah. Or you do a face frame. Yeah. That's going to help you out mm-hmm. somewhat in in stiffening up the shelves. Yeah. You I'll, know what one of the woodworking guys said to me? I can't wait. Torsion boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what some of the others said first. So I said I posed the same question at the woodworking uh, lunch table yesterday yeah. when we were sitting there. Oh, and uh, John Tetro says, oh, I'd probably make it out of solid boards that I have in my barn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I know you would. Yeah. And another guy said, well, I'm, I would make it out of Baltic birch. And I was like, and then you edge band the front. He's like, no, I would just round them over and leave the laminations exposed. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I love it. I mean, I've that's, done that. that's You've sort done of that? like one of the advantages of using Baltic birch is that it's so nice looking, you know, and that like because those lambs are so thick and nice and even that you can do that. Yeah. Do Talk you think my wife your would budget, though? Yeah. Do, oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah? expensive because the sheets yeah. are what? Five by five? They're five by five. Yeah. So, so usually. He yeah. was telling me he, he, was telling ones, me yeah. that he was getting four by eights because mm-hmm. if it was only yeah. five by five, that'd be a deal breaker for me. You can get four by eights. You might have to inquire. Yeah. But it's not cheap. Is it going to be twice as much? Oh, maybe. Uh, I don't know if it's don't twice, know twice as much. But no. it's coming from the Baltics. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real. I don't think. I think most of it actually is made in Russia. Should Baltic I, style. Should yeah. I be supporting the Russian economy? <laughs> it depends. I don't know. It may be under tariffs right now. Who knows? Yeah. Banned. Man. It's getting political. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, you guys I mean, are no uh, help. <laughs> let me think. Let me, let me think what I would do if I was you. Keeping in mind it's me. I, keeping in mind it's you, I would probably get melamine. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the absolute cheapest thing? It's the cheapest. It's it's known. It goes together. I don't know. It's like you can buy. So you, like if your closet is twelve is two feet deep, you can buy stuff that's probably 20 inches or whatever deep, pre-cut to the right width, and then you just have to adjust to length, assemble a big thing, and you're going to be done with it. And you're going to be so excited that everything is clean and neat and you don't have to finish anything. I'm, um, I'm liking this idea. Yeah, so, I mean, you're probably that's why people go that way. Yeah. Um, or you can be like me and just not finish it. I gave the plywood yeah. a little bit of a sanding and <laughs> cut it up. Yeah, my, my, my closet <laughs> built don't even have drawer fronts. Yeah. <laughs> Mine is just open boxes. 
<laughs> like cardboard, cardboard boxes. Just like it's that's a, another way I could go. Well, I mean, you saw the shot. It basically looks like a gigantic bank of like IKEA shelves or something like yeah. that. It's like three high. Yeah, that's what my wife's got too. Yeah, she's got a pine just board cubbies. across two of them yeah. to create a space in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I should just Great. do that. I bet fun. I have enough stuff lying around the house I could just make cinder blocks. Just stack like a dorm them. room. Yeah. yeah, cinder blocks and boards. Right. Well, I mean, melamine is probably the best way to go. I, I like the idea of having a little more of a project, you know, putting some cleats on the wall, cutting plywood and fitting it and, you know, kind of building up and using the, you know, the space rather than building cubes. Mm-hmm. So here's here's another thing I thought about. I hate cubes. I hate building cubes. Have you guys seen like the closet organizing systems from Ikea? Like you can buy even doors. Uh, yeah. And the problem is... I love the the speed, right? Like you'd bring these boxes home and conceivably by the end of the weekend or or a day, you're done. But the stuff is so cheaply made. It is so crappy. Mm -hmm. It is pretty durable though, I got to say. Because, you know, I've had a lot of that stuff for years because I lived in Germany for a while. And and, you're a bachelor. And and I was a bachelor at the time (laughs) and I bought all this stuff and it was relatively inexpensive. It was easily put together. Um, And... I've taken it apart and put it back together multiple times. I mean, I, I, I had a lot of this stuff in Germany, moved back to the U.S., moved back to Germany and back to the U.S., and I still have a lot of this stuff, and it still works fine. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to say it's, like, the best quality stuff. And they have different grades. I mean, you know, there is stuff that, you know, you probably would never want to take apart and, and put back together again. Um, but, I mean, as long as you're just planning on leaving it there, you can't you almost can't beat the the price and like the functionality it's going to be fine let me ask you how do you like to what do you want to spend your time on do you want a project do you want something that you're going to have some satisfaction putting it together and like feeling like you did a piece of craftsmanship so do you want a solution that's quick so you're going to be done with it you've known me a long time you right? want you want cheap and <laughs> fast. I, I want i'm very task oriented right i, I <laughs> I, I, I get stuff done quickly, right, and and move on. I like to do lots of small things rather than a long, drawn-out uh-huh. process, right? So getting it done is, like, my first priority. Do you, are you opposed to cleats on the wall, shelves nailed down into them? No. I mean, that seems to me like uh, a decent option. A no-brainer with a normal closet rod and brackets. Mm-hmm. And what about, like, drawers? Buy IKEA furniture and put it in there. Do you want drawers? I think I do. Yeah. Because I want to lose a. I'm going to have to lose my dresser, right? Because there's the wall we're putting our bed that f- presently houses my dresser is going to be much t- narrower. If you get into drawers now. Now your life's harder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or cubbies, you know. Box. Yeah. Cubbies Some, is easy. The cubbies. I mean, the reason for that in my closet is it's not very wide, and so all these hanging bars on the one side, like if you had drawers in there, you wouldn't really be able to pull them out without having to back into, sure. you know, sort of like Homer, like going back into the bush. And that's an issue <laughs> between, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's possibly, not be a, possibly the most obscure reference yeah. ever. <laughs> there's not going to be a lot of room for opening drawers either, so it's, that's another da- strike against that. Mm-hmm. You guys have given me a lot to think about. No help, but a lot to think about. I just yeah. can't believe pre-finished plywood is so cheap for you. Is that Ring's End? Um, Atlantic plywood. Mm. How are you going to get that? You're going to have a loading dock in your house? <laughs> <laughs> so very coincidentally, we have a, a big cabinet shop now near the yeah. office. They're here every week. So you're going to order it through a local cabinet shop? No, I'm going to order it through Atlantic and have them deliver it to the uh, to here. Are you going to tell gonna... the local cabinet shop that it's coming? <laughs> well, they're going to deliver it here. They've delivered here bef- for other people. Really? Yeah. Mm. Dude, you should see the stuff they have in stock. It'll blow your mind. Yeah, but they have veneer plywood in like 100 species. Hmm. But let me, I'm just trying to understand. So like fine home building doesn't have a cabinet company, but the building next door to us runs a cabinet shop. So how do you make the leap from getting the stuff delivered to a local cabinet shop that you're not doing anything with? They come here anyway. Out of the every, kindness of their heart. No, they come here <laughs> every week oh, yeah. as part of their run, yeah. right? And they're just going to have a stop at the Taunton offices next door to the to the cabinet company. So you're like, just going to offload it, yeah, like onto your okay. into my truck. I just figured they would only do it to, if you had a loading dock or something. He's yeah. just going to monitor what yeah. comes off the truck, and see what he likes. And before those guys are all outside. dressed in black out there, yeah. little black, <laughs> his, his little black robber outfit that he wears. Yep. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to go to the cabinet shop and just ask him for their offcuts and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> rummage in their dumpster. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. 
thanks to uh, Matt and Justin for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And uh, please like, comment, or review us wherever you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Why don't you do it, Justin? What? <laughs> Sorry, I started reading the something sign-off. <laughs> oh. Uh, keep craft alive and happy building. Excellent. Excellent.